Hi everyone and welcome back. You're watching Miss Versatile. Today when I was walking to the train it was so cold and foggy and I decided when I get back home I'm going to do something different. I've decided that I'm going to read the book Insomnia by Stephen King. I've been told many times that my voice is a very soothing voice so I decided just to try this out. So um, I'm just going to read, I'm going to see if I can finish this book, uh, do a couple of videos of course, a couple more than just a couple, um, but I'd like to start. No one, least of all Dr. Litchfield, came right out and told Ralph Roberts that his wife was going to die, but there came a time when Ralph understood without needing to be told. The months between March and June were a jangling, screaming time inside his head, a time of conferences with doctors, of evening runs to the hospital with Caroline, of trips to the other hospitals in other states for special tests. Ralph spent much of his travel time on these trips, thanking God for Caroline's Blue Cross major medical coverage. Of personal research in the Deary Public Library, at first looking for answers the specialists might have overlooked, later on just looking for hope and grasping at straws. Those four months were like being dragged drunk through some maligned carnival where the people on the rides were really screaming. The people lost in the mirror maze were really lost. And the denizens of Freak Alley looked at you with false smiles on their lips and terror in their eyes. Ralph began to see these things by the middle of May, and as June set in, he began to understand that the pitchmen along the medical midway had only quack remedies to sell. And the cheery quick step of the Calliope could no longer quite hide the fact that the tune spilling out of the loudspeakers was the funeral march. It was a carnival, all right. The carnival of lost souls. Ralph continued to deny these terrible images and the even more terrible idea lurking behind them although the early summer of 1992, but as June gave way to July, this finally became impossible. The worst midsummer heat wave since 1971 rolled over the central main, and dairy simmered in bays of hazy sun, humidity, and daily temperatures in the mid-90s. The city Hardly a bustling metropolis at the best of times, fell into a complete stupor. And it was in this hot silence that Ralph Roberts first heard the ticking of the death watch and understood that in the passage from June's cool, damp greens to the baked stillness of July, Carolyn's slim chances had become no chances at all. She was going to die. Not this summer. Probably the doctors claimed to have quite a few tricks up their sleeves yet, and Ralph was sure they did. But this fall, or this winter, his longtime companion, the only woman he had ever loved, was going to die. He tried to deny the idea, scolding himself for being a morbid old fool. But in the gasping silences of those long, hot days, Ralph heard that ticking everywhere. It even seemed to be in the walls. Yet it was loudest from within Caroline herself, and when she turned her calm, white face toward him, perhaps to ask him to turn on the radio so she could listen while she shelled some beans for their supper, or to ask him if he would go across to the red apple and get her an ice cream on a stick, he would see that she heard it too. He would see it in her dark eyes, at first only when she was straight, but later even when her eyes were hazed by the pain medication she took. By then the ticking had grown very loud, and when Ralph lay in bed beside her on those hot summer nights, when even a single sheet seemed to weigh ten pounds and he believed every dog in Derry was barking at the moon, he listened to it, to the death watch ticking inside Caroline, and it seemed to him 
that his heart would break with sorrow and terror. How much would she be required to suffer before the end came? How much would he be required to suffer? And how could he possibly live without her? It was during this strange, fraught period that Ralph began to go for increasingly long walks through the hot summer afternoons and slow, twilight evenings, returning on many occasions too exhausted to eat. He kept expecting Caroline to scold him for these outings, to say, Why don't you stop it, you stupid old man? You'll kill yourself if you keep walking in this heat. But she never did and he gradually realized she didn't even know. Then he went out. Yes, she knew that. But all the miles he went, or that when he came home he was often trembling with exhaustion and near sunstroke. Once upon a time it had seemed to Ralph she saw everything, even a change of half an inch in where he parted his hair. No more. The tumor in her brain had stolen her powers of observation, as it would soon steal her life. So he walked, relishing the heat in spite of the way it sometimes made his head swim and his ears ring, relishing it mostly because of the way it made his ears ring. Sometimes there were whole hours when they rang so loudly and his head pounded so fiercely that he couldn't hear the tick of Carolyn's death watch. He walked over much of Deary that hot July. A narrow-shouldered old man with thinning white hair and big hands that still looked capable of hard work. He walked from Witcham Street to the Barrens, from Candace, Kansas Street to Niebold Street, from Main Street to Kissing Bridge, but his feet took him most frequently west along Harris Avenue, where the still beautiful and much beloved Caroline Roberts was now spending her last year in a haze of headaches, morphine to the Harris Avenue extensions and Derry County Airport. He would walk out the extension, which was treeless and completely exposed to the pitiless sun until he felt his legs threatening to cave in beneath him and then double back. He often paused to catch a second wind in a shady picnic area close to the airport service entrance. At night this place was a teenage drinking and makeout spot, alive with the sounds of rap coming from the boombox radios but during the days it was more or less exclusive domain for a group Ralph's friend, Bill McGovern, called the Harris Avenue Old Crocs. The Old Crocs gathered to play chess, to play gin, or just to shoot the shit. Ralph had known many of them for years, had, in fact, gone to grammar school with Stan Everly, and was comfortable with them as long as they didn't get too nosy. Most didn't. They were old school Yankees, for the most part, raised to believe that what a man doesn't choose to talk about is no one's business but his own.